السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. After praising Allah subhanahu wa taala and the Lord of the heavens and the earth, the King of all kings, the controller of all affairs, He is aware of every single feeling that passes through our hearts and every single thought that goes through our minds. فعنده مفاتيح الغيب لا يعلمها إلا هو. With him are the keys to the unseen, and nobody knows them except him. ويعلم ما في البر والبحر. And he is aware of every single thing that is in dry land, and every single thing that are in the depths of the ocean. وَمَا تَسْقُطُ مِنْ وَرَقَةٍ إِلَّا يَعْلَمُهَا And a leaf doesn't move on a tree except that he knows about it. وَلَا حَبَّةٍ فِي ظُلُمَاتِ الْأَرْضِ And a grain of wheat does not move in the darkness of the night except that he knows about it. وَلَا رَطْبٍ وَلَا يَابِسٍ إِلَّا فِي كِتَابٍ مُبِينٍ Nothing is wet, nothing is dry except that it is recorded in a clear book. He is خالق كل شيء, he is the creator of everything. And he is على كل شيء قدير, he has power over all possible things. After praising that individual where there's not a single person that can ever match his worth in character or in beauty to ever walk on earth, I envy every rock and tree and every grain of sand that embraced his noble feet or that kissed his blessed hand. As a great Imam al-Busiri rahimahullah ta'ala, Sharaf al-Din al-Busiri or Busayri rahimahullah says in his Burda Sharifa, he says, فَاقَلْ نَبِيِّينَ فِي خَلْقٍ وَفِي خُلُقٍ وَلَمْ يُدَانُوهُ فِي عِلْمٍ وَلَا كَرَمٍ that he tops the prophets in both appearance and in character. They don't approach him in knowledge or in generosity. He's the greatest of creation. He's our beloved. He's the beloved of Allah. Sayyiduna wa nabiyuna wa habibuna Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. I'd like to first of all ex express and extend my gratitude to uh, uh, the MCC, uh, this uh, beautiful masjid, the organization, and the brothers that, uh, you know, invited me alhamdulillah it's always a great honor to be here uh, i guess i'm not a uh, a visiting guest anymore it's like mashallah i'm coming back quite regularly um, so it's uh, and it's the love of mashallah all of you brothers in particular i'm very very extremely honored always to be uh, sharing a stage and a platform with uh, amu tarif mashallah may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless them they are like our teacher our elder uh, and some someone who mashallah is an inspiration to this community an inspiration to myself as well uh, so when we think of the Burda, uh, we think of, uh, you know, people think of myself, I say, no, think of Amutarif. Yeah. And then Amutarif will say, think of Sheikh Samir, yeah. you know, and, and subhanAllah, there are so many amazing people who have, who have sort of like, um, you know, been an icon for these things, alhamdulillah. Uh, so it's a great honor. Again, I'd like to thank every single person, inshallah. Thank you guys for coming out. I know the weather is not the best. I uh, escaped uh, Chicago because I wanted some sun. Uh, but unfortunately, I, I only met uh, California with some rain. Uh, but Adi, alhamdulillah, it's still warmer, so it's okay. Um, so it is what it is, and, and that's, that's the way things work. This is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordains things. Uh, the, the ulama, the Sufiya would say, don't complain about the weather. Say, it's, it's what Allah wants. You shouldn't really be complaining. Uh, but I guess we're weak people, and you know, we, we want something. And, uh, but this is the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works. He, he gives us something. If he wants to give it us, and if he doesn't want to give it us, then there's a blessing in the deprivation. Being deprived of something, Ibn Ata'illah al-Iskandir rahimahullah, he says, that when Allah deprives you of something, there's a blessing in that. But you want something really, really badly, but Allah keeps it from you. There's a blessing in that. The thing is, it's about our perspective. We're supposed to see it. We have to find it. Um, and if you don't find it, if you con continuously... Worry about your nafs and what you want rather than looking at what Allah has done for you. Right? Then, then you're going to be confused all the time and your, your opinion of Allah won't be as strong as the opinions that the great ulama and the sufiya and the awliya would, would hold. And that's why they were content. Right? The, the awliya Allah, the friends of Allah, those that are close to Allah, they don't fear, they don't have any uh, uh, sort of uh, worry or anything like that. Why? Because the, uh, their opinion of Allah was so great that whatever Allah would have put them through, they were happy and content with that. So if Allah was depriving them of something, you know, I, I don't know, whatever the, the things are that you would want in life. I want a nice house, I want a nice wife, I want another wife. Astaghfirullah, I should uh, you know, not be promoting polygamy, I'll get lynched. Uh, by my own wife. Um, so I don't know, whatever people promote or whatever want, whatever desire that you have, subhanAllah, 
you know, sometimes you want something and Allah doesn't give it to you. But there's a khair in that. There's always a khair in that. And, and sometimes something happens in your life and you have to know that this is all controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything is controlled by Allah. Uh, we, we believe in, in, in our tradition that Allah creates every single action. Yes, Allah creates action. We, will, we have a will. But, so we choose to do something and Allah creates the action. Okay, so whatever happens therefore, uh, and we, we know in this in when, we, when we affirm our faith, we say, uh, That all good and bad destinies from Allah most high. So everything that happens, it's happened you know, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted it to happen. Um, I received a question the other day, you know, a, a young girl uh, asked her mother, she says, oh, well, if Allah wants something to happen, then why is it that, you know, people are uh, doing so many evil things? Is, does that mean Allah wants evil to happen? And it's a good question. Children are inquisitive. Uh, and maybe it's for us to think about, right? And the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us a free reign for us to choose is because if he didn't, then there would be no test. So although Allah creates the action, he gives us the choice to choose what we want to do. Okay, and, and so that's why people do evil. And although Allah creates the action, okay, Allah has given us that choice because that's the test. As the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, So the Mufassirun say, لِيَبَلُوَكُمْ أَيْ لِيَخْتَبِرَكُمْ In order to inform you or test you, أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ amala, Which of you does the better deeds? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's why he's created life and death. People then ask a question, and this is a, a, a common question. If Allah already knows what we're going to do, then what's the point of Allah testing us? And this is probably a question that comes into your minds. When I was studying um, uh, Western philosophy, so we, we did, um, I did philosophy at A-levels. I don't know whether you have A-levels or not. Uh, so post, um, post uh, school. Uh, you call college and university school. So we have like our uh, grade up to grade 11 and grade 12 and 13 is our A-levels as we call it. So, so you know, I, I studied, I took on philosophy and in philosophy they, they, they teach us philosophy of religion and they teach us about God and all of these questions come into your mind like uh, they, they, they pose these questions to you and, and subhanAllah that's why some of the ulama have said be very careful before you study philosophy because if you don't have a strong grounding in aqidah or parts of kalam then you'll struggle so they they ask certain questions so for example you know people uh, you know they this is a question that is posed to you and it's probably posed to your children in school or in you know when when they go and maybe uh, subhanallah and sometimes we there is a generation gap and we don't realize that your children and the youth are getting questioned about these things right but you're sitting at home and you send your child to the madrasa and to the classes right but you don't realize that your children's getting brainwashed in school because you don't ask and you don't communicate with your children. Right? So, and this is the biggest problem. These whole concepts, you know, like liberalism and, and everything that comes under liberalism, like, you know, the LGBTQ movement and all these kind of things, uh, you know, and I don't mean to be politically incorrect here. We're living in a country where, uh, you know, we can't really say anything except that we, we can only state what Islam says about it, right? And we state it as a matter of fact. But, the reason why sometimes our children are getting duped into these things is because we as parents or elders don't have a direct connection with our children regarding what they're doing and who they're accompanying in schools, uh, universities, as you'd say, or colleges or whatever. So, so that's, uh, that's an issue. So these questions, even like, say, for example, your, I, I took a class in, uh, in my, during my studies and the, these questions were being posed, to, they, they were being asked, they were being posed. I didn't go home and tell my dad like, oh, you know, uh, you know, this is what we learned today because you think this is basically school. This is what we do, right? But thankfully, you know, I, I, my, my parents raised me up well enough to, for me to understand that, look, if there is something I'm confused about, I should ask. So I didn't ask my father, but I went and asked my teachers. Uh, we were studying, um, and this is going back, uh, I don't want to expose my age. People often ask. Uh, this is going back a good 12, 12 to 15 years. So we were studying and uh, I was actually studying uh, Umul Barahin uh, by Imam Sanusi. It's a it's a primer in Aqidah at that, at that point anyway. So this question came came. So why why does God test us? What's the point of the test if He already knows what's going to happen? 
So me and uh, one of my friends, uh, a colleague of mine, who, mashallah, went to study and he became, mashallah, uh, he's a good young scholar as well. We were there together in the class and we came up with this argument. We call it the cookie jar argument. Okay, and, and this is a, so when people ask the question, we say, look, just, just let's, let's pose the, or let's give them the cookie jar argument. Say as a, as a mother or as a father, you know, you've told your child, listen, don't eat sweets. Don't go to the sweetie jar. So you have a jar full of candy, sorry, you, you call it candy. So you have a jar full of candy or sweets and you've told your child you're not allowed to eat from that jar. Babe, now what happens is you see your child crawling or walking towards that jar and you know, for obviously you're not there so he's done it without you looking, you know for a hundred, a hundred percent fact you're absolutely sure that this child is now going to get the candy. He's going to get the sweets. Now, the question is this. If you're, to, if you're to grab the child and punish the child before he's even got the candy, before he's even uh, taken the sweet out of the jar, what's the child going to say to you? Why did you hit me for? Why did you hit me? Like, right? Although you're absolutely sure that the child's going to go and get the candy. He's going to get the sweet. But the child will say, well, why have you, why have you hit me? However, if you, if you had to wait, the child obviously gets the candy. And then you were to reprimand the child. Then can the child say, oh, why have you hit me? No, because he's actually done something which was wrong. So this is actually the understanding of Allah knowing what you're going to do doesn't change the fact that you're going to do it. Just like the mother knows that the child's going to go and take the candy, it's not going to change the fact that the child's got, made that choice to take the candy. That's why Allah says, أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا And that's why the ulama say, لِيَخْتَبِرَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا That Allah has created death, He's created life, just to test you, to inform you, to see who's going to do good and who's going to do bad or who's going to do the better deeds. The, the alif lam removed from Ahsan means it's better, not the best. Some translations say who's going to do the best of deeds. It's actually the better of deeds. Okay, so Ahsanu Amala. So that's why Allah has created this life to see who's going to do better and who's not. Who's going to choose to do the right things and who's not. And despite Allah knowing the actions that you're going to do, it doesn't change the fact that you have the choice to do it. Right? Because traditionally what would happen is certain people would fall into despair and they'd be like, well, What's the point of life? Because God already knows what I'm going to do. So I might as well just, just do anything. No, you still have the choice. That you've chosen to come here today. You're getting ajr for it. You're getting reward for it. Each breath that you take in a masjid, if you have the correct intention, Allah blesses you and He gives you reward for it. You chose to come here. Right? Just the same way you have a choice. So, so this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uh, you know, this, this, this whole creation. Allah has created it to test us. This is what we're... Uh, here for so subhanallah uh, you know we, we thank Allah we thank Allah for inspiring us uh, inspiring us and giving us uh, you know this opportunity to you know uh, come and, and listen to you know the kalam of Allah and, and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa words about his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa poetry about him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam so when we have these questions or we have sort of, sort of uh, you know thing, uh, issues regarding our aqidah or our faith we should always question uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear um, it's, uh, you know, going into these, these matters is, is not, there's no shame or blame in a person actually questioning. Uh, and sometimes uh, it's probably a cultural thing. Uh, but some parents are like, oh, don't question. But you should question. Allah is very clear. And this is a, a very interesting, it's an interesting kalam that we have. Uh, the word of Allah, you know, where we're, ask, we're, we're being asked to submit to him. Udkhulu fi silmi kafatan. Completely. But at the same time, we're also asked to question. And you, you could argue that there's a contradiction there because if submission actually in, uh, in essence means whatever happens, you know, I, I submit, right? But at the same time, Allah is asking to question. Why? Because uh, submission is one element of it. There's, there's a balance that we have to find. Um, we submit to every single thing that the Prophet ﷺ came with. ما جاء به النبي صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. It's actually the definition of, uh, you know, the 
the the the, the Prophet or what, what we come with or as a Muslim what we're supposed to have or what we're supposed to do anything that the Rasul وسلم, comes with we accept but at the same time if there's a problem there's an issue then we, we are ought to, we do ought to question and think and ponder that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says al -Quran? he asks do you not ponder over the Quran or are your hearts locked yeah, Allah says, قُلْ هَاتُوا بُرْهَانَكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And if you have a doubt, bring all of your evidences if you're truthful. But where do you, where do you bring your evidences? Where do you question? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعَلَمُونَ Ask the people of remembrance, ask the people of ilm if you don't know. Okay, so it's important that whenever, especially children, especially, you know, you ever have a doubt, right? You go to the right people and you question them and you ask them. And if they don't respond to you, then go ask somebody else. Uh, but don't ever leave you know, your faith in, in, in doubt or any, anything in doubt, um, uh, in sort of um, something incomplete. Don't leave it incomplete. Otherwise, there's always going to be issues. And that's the, the shaitan for you. He will, he will allow that doubt to grow and grow until uh, it becomes detrimental. So that's one element of, of it. Uh, the, other, the other thing, actually, I, I, I was thinking of multiple things before I came because I was told that we have to, uh, uh, well, at least the, the topic was speak about aqidah and speak about belief uh, and how the youth can sort of, you know, uh, understand. We, we, and there was, there was a few uh, sort of ways I could have tackled this. So I was thinking in my head, how do I tackle it? Either I go through uh, the history of, of aqidah and, understand, you know, or at least kalam, and, uh, but that could, be very, that could become very complicated. Um, and there's also the, the idea of what actually aqidah is or, Aqidah comes from the word aqad, which means um, to tie a knot. Because in essence, our belief and our faith uh, has to be very, very tight. To the point where the ulama say that the, your iman or your belief or your faith has to be 100%. Anything less than that is not complete iman. Uh, and, and within our iman, we have, of course, to, to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one. Uh, and the, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger. Um, so, from an usuli perspective and a furu'i perspective, there's a hadith which makes it very clear. It's mentioned in the, uh, the Arba'een as well that Al Haramu Bayin wal Halalu Bayin, uh, kama qala alayhi salatu salam. The Haram is very clear and the Halal is very clear. Uh, this can be tackled from two perspectives either a, jurispru uh, a, a perspective of jurisprudence through fiqh or even through usul, ay aqidah. That whatever is clear is clear and we don't waver from that. For example, there are people who say, for example, have issues with the finality of the Prophet Sallallahu um, Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, these are, for some people, these are, uh, people don't like to talk about it because they say it's not practical. and You know, children don't really, let's talk about something else. But these are matters of faith which need to be tackled. So there are people who believe or uh, have this assumption that there can be a prophet after the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam which is sarih uh, kufr it's disbelief okay because there can't be a prophet after the rasul sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sallam and this is categorically proven in the quran wherein the prophet sallallahu alaihi wa sallam is being spoken spoken about by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ma kana muhammadun aba ahadin bir rijalikum وَلَكِنْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَخَاتَمَ النَّبِيِّينَ Yes, okay. Uh, the uh, finality of the prophethood is established. Um, so, that's clear. That's bayin. Uh, at the same time, there are people who, who you know, um, have a, who fail to understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, again, these things are bayin. So, it's important that we uh, understand that. Now, once we understand that, and this is, mashallah, what Amu Tarif just said to me, um, it's not just about understanding, it's also about then submitting and then loving Allah and loving His Rasul, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. But you can't love someone if you don't know them. That's why we, ta we tackle it from that perspective first. That it, it, it's very, it's very um, and you've probably heard this many times before, how can you claim to love Someone, if you've never, if you don't know them, it's it's actually impossible. And by knowing them doesn't necessarily mean you know absolutely everything about them. Knowing of them is probably can can just be enough. But to actively make a conscious decision to 
to think about Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi sahbihi sallam, which is, which is something that we don't do anymore. You're going about your day and you're busy with work and uh, children and family and uh, whatever you're, you're busy with. How many times you actively take a moment to stop and think about Allah and think about His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi sahbihi sallam. Because reflection is the first step. Reflection leads to adoration. So once you reflect, then you adore. And then adoration leads to love. And the problem is what's in our minds? What are we reflecting on? What are we thinking about? Morocco won the world, are going to win the World Cup. I don't know. It's not, a, it's not a big thing in the US soccer, football, but we're very mad about it. Um, I, that's what you're thinking about. You're thinking about what, I, what, am, I, what, what am I going to cook tomorrow for, for, for the family? And all of these things, you're, that's fine. These are obligations and you're supposed to think about them. But how many times do we, we stop and we reflect just on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, on just the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what he's done for us. And, and for that, we, it requires us to be conscious about them. Conscious about them, like genuinely conscious about them. It's very interesting because when we hear some very scary, I, I would say very scary ahadith, very scary traditions like, La yu'minu ahadukum. None of you will truly be a believer. That's actually, you know, although we, and, and when, when the khatib or the imam or the sheikh is he's speaking and he ever quotes this hadith, you think, subhanAllah, and it's wow, it's. Because it's about the, the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa and that, that element of it is beautiful, yes. But, la yu'minu ahadukum, that's very scary as well. That you will not be a believer. None of you are a believer until, hatta, and there's various multiple narrations, until you love Allah, and his, uh, or rather, until you love the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than you love your parents, your children. And in another narration, everything that your heart desires. Right? And, and, and when you look at other narrations, for example, when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu anhu arda, he comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I love you more than everything except myself. Yes, and, and the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, uh, oh, Umar, that's not enough. Okay, and then, and for, for Umar radiallahu anhu, it was a switch of a button. Because he just said that. And it became a hujja for us. And through the hadith, it became a proof for us, right? So he says, okay, Ya Rasulullah, you know, I, I love you more than everything, including myself. And that's when the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replies, Al-an tamma uh, imanuk. Al-an, Ya Umar, tamma imanuk. Now your iman is complete. Loving the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more than every single thing, even yourself, even what your heart desires, is something which is actually what we're supposed to do in order for us to be complete and true uh, uh, believers. But really, really think about that. Reflect on that. Really reflect on that because there's an issue. Because if we're not reflecting on the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam enough in our day, we can't even attain that love. So what are you doing? And, and by the way, you can, you can set up practical solutions in your day in order to, to, to attain that. For example, like we, uh, you know, uh, mashallah, Tarif is here. Uh, you know, we, we, we do this regularly where we, we hold gatherings of Burda, for example. Why? Because these are incentives for us to come and, and sit and, and recite uh, about Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. These are the things. But if you're not even doing that, how are you going to love Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam if you don't give your, your, yourself any time to reflect about him, reflect about his attributes, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and reflect about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam and what he's done for you. And, I, and, and, and that's something that we need to incorporate within our lives, within our day to day, that we should take time out to teach our children, teach ourselves, right? Where, where are we, what are we going to do in our day, in our daily lives, where, wherein we can stop and think about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. So whether it's I don't know, uh, holding a gathering of dhikr or doing something like that or after, after, after your salah, you know, sitting on, on the, on the musalla, sitting on the sajada, on the prayer mat for like five minutes, just thinking and reflecting. 
and thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, and thanking him for the for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Incorporate these small, small things in your life and you'll see that your life will change because that's how you will improve and increase your love for him subhanahu wa ta'ala and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Finally, actually, love is a very, very, um, it's an ajeeb thing. It can destroy you and it can make you as well at the same time. Uh, that's just the nature of love, right? Uh, the Arabs actually, interestingly, had 14 levels of love. Um, and we're, again, we're very moderate in, 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 our, in our love for Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The last level of love actually is a complete annihilation where you can't even live, so you kill yourself, okay? Uh, because you're, you completely and utterly love something. Okay? And that, uh, of course, it's, it's, uh, it's khilaf is sharia. We can't actually even get to, probably people maybe get to that level. Uh, it's not Romeo and Juliet, but uh, people may get to that level, but the, the Arabs would, they, they categorized love. Okay, and, but we, we should get to a level wherein, you know, we, we, we can't do anything except think about Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Yes, and, and, and that's the level that we should try and aim to get at because that's ex extremely, extremely important for us. Now, um, again, how do you love? So this is the question now, how, how, how do you increase love and what is, what is love? Love's an emotion, it's a feeling. You can't command anyone to love, uh, love someone. I actually mentioned this yesterday in the gathering. And I said like, you can't, you can't command someone to love someone. I can't tell you, you have to love, you know, uh, X, Y, Z. But uh, I made a joke yesterday. I said, you know, like, uh, it's in the Desi community, like, they make you marry your Jachi's daughter, your, your cousin from uh, back home in Pakistan or India. They make you marry. You have to marry her. Like, uh, <laughs> what do you mean I have to marry her? But, which is haram, by the way. Uh, you know, Ajib, like, why are you forcing me to marry someone? You're forcing me to love someone. You can't do that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not, so that's why there's no way in the Quran, like loving the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, there's no, it's like, it's not a, a, a fard in terms of a legal ruling. But for, in terms of everything else, it's fard. So spiritually, in terms of ihsan especially, it's fard. We have to love the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, otherwise our iman is not complete. But can you make it a tangible legal ruling? No, because you can't force anybody to love someone. So you have to do certain things to increase your love for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because that's what's going to give spirit to your iman, to your Islam. That is ihsan in essence. Yes, and ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah fa illam takun tarah fa innahu yarak. It's actually not divorced from the idea of loving the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tarah. That you worship Allah as if you can see him. And what did they say that there are certain people who remind you of Allah. There are certain people that when you look at them, they remind you of Allah. Who can remind you of Allah better than looking at Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So how is it that the Sahaba reached this level of anta'bud Allah ka anna ka tara? They only needed, needed to look at the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they were seeing Allah. And astaghfirullah, and I don't mean to say that we're not even likening the two. But what I'm saying is the fact that they looked at the, the face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that reminded them of Allah. That's what allowed them to reach the highest level of ihsan because they were worshipping Allah as if they could see him. Yes? Because, and, and, and we, we often make this, uh, this um, we, we inform you regarding the Quran and what the Quran is. When, we, when I say Quran to you, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Tell me now, if I said Qur'an to you, what's the first thing that comes into your mind? Imagine the Qur'an. What is it? What's the first thing? Mus'haf, the book. I say Qur'an to you, the first thing that's going to come to your mind naturally is the, is the books, the Mus'haf. But was there a Mus'haf in the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? No. So when you said Qur'an to the companions, there were only two things that they could possibly imagine. The face of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the voice, the blessed voice of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That was, that was an ta'bud Allah ka anna ka tara. That was, that, that was, that was ihsan for the sahaba. That was the truth. And fa'illam takun tara. If you cannot see Allah, 
فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكْ Then know that he's seeing you. Yes? Uh, this reminds me of our conversation yesterday. I, you know, uh, Amu, Amu said to me that, uh, you know, near when we come towards the day of judgment, uh, it, 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 this will be a time wherein people will have more visions, you know, uh, and, and uh, experiences. And interestingly, the reason for, for that is because Iman and faith and all these things, they can't be established through proofs, really. They're just, that's just supplementary. In order for you to actually believe, you have to have some sort of experience. Yes, so, you know, and, and because proofs and all these things are becoming scarce, you know, and, and the, the strength of evidences are becoming scarce, especially in this day and age, in this time, as we're going uh, further towards the Day of Judgment, they're becoming very, very hard to get hold of. Allah will increase visions for people and experiences for people. So I said to Amu, I said, Allahumma ja'alna minhum. May Allah make, make us amongst those people who experience those visions. And, and Amu replied, no, you'd rather allow, or allow the Prophet to see you than you see the Prophet Because the Prophet having nadar upon you is greater than the you having nadar upon or looking to the, at the Prophet yes? So, Ihsan, true Ihsan, true spirituality, to reach that, you have to understand that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you make him the center point of your life. So how then do you love him? How do you increase that love? If you want to love someone, I said you have to know them. Number two, generally, if you want to love someone and increase your love towards someone or for someone, you have to understand what they've done for you. Or if, they, if a person does favors for you, you, it increases your love. Like for example, the, the most superficial way is giving gifts to someone. This is mentioned in the hadith. That if I was to give you a gift, that increases love between the two. It's also a love language. You read the Gary Chapman's five love languages. Yeah, one of them is gift giving. Yes? Uh, because it increases love. So you should give gifts to uh, your spouses. Yes? Because it increases love. But that's the, probably the lowest, the lowest level, okay, because it's something physical, it's tangible. Why? Because you're doing something for someone else. Also acts of service, it's also another one. You're doing something for someone else. If you want to increase your love for the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa you have to understand three things. Number one, what he has done for you. Number two, what he is doing for you. And number three, what he will do for you. Sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And every single one of them is equally as important. And we can just briefly go through these inshallah before I conclude. Just for us to understand what he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, means. What has he done for us? If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know Allah. That's a, that's a given fact. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have the Qur'an. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have guidance. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have the Sunnah. If it wasn't for him, women would still be probably oppressed, being buried alive. If it wasn't for him, this world would be chaos. If it wasn't for him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, things would have been in anarchy. And Allah makes this very clear in the Qur'an. وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلُ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Before Allah mentions the... Or after Allah mentions the fact that Allah has favored us with the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, He says, وَإِن كَانُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ لَفِي ضَلَالٍ مُبِينٍ Before him, everything was in complete darkness and misguidance. And probably at that era, it's, it's said, the ulama say that it's probably the worst of eras ever. Just before the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came into, came into this world. What has he done for us? He's given us structure. He's given us... He's given us everything. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have a purpose. If it wasn't for him, we wouldn't know Allah. And that's uh, probably, there's nothing else I can say regarding what, what he's, there's nothing greater I can say except that he's given us access to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the key to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Well, that's what he's done for us. How about what he's doing for you now? Very interestingly, you know, um, some of the, if you read the Quran, we should make a, a habit of reading the Quran. And just reciting the Quran and understanding the Quran. 
um, I often say that when, when, you know, when the Sahaba were told to recite the Quran or read the Quran, for them, it wasn't a just. It wasn't just something. Uh, well, the way we tell you, or somebody tells you, oh, it's Sunnah to read, for example, Surah Al-Kahf on a Friday, or, or you should recite Surah Al-Mulk after Maghrib, or uh, you know, like we did earlier. We just recite, don't we? So when the Sahaba were doing this, for them it wasn't just mere recitation, it was understanding as well. So if, you, if, you, if the Prophet ﷺ is telling the Sahaba, for example, you do this or recite this, for them it wasn't recite the way we recite. And therefore that's an implication for us to understand also what we recite. That's where the Sunnah actually is. If I'm reading Surah Al-Kahf on a Friday and just reading it, yeah, you'll get reward for it, of course. But it's not just about merely reading, it's also about understanding it. Why is Surah Al-Kahf, again, this is just the example that's coming to my head right now, why is Surah Al-Kahf a sunnah? And what, what does the Prophet ﷺ say? It protects you from the fitna of the Dajjal. Why though? How? How does it? Read it and understand what it's trying to say. إِنَّا جَعَلْنَا مَا عَلَى الْأَرْضِ زِينَةً لَهَا لِنَبْلَوْهُمْ أَيُّهُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا uh, and the, all of the stories are to do with the physical, the tangible things that you can see. And Allah is saying in, in Surah Al-Kahf, in all of the stories, right? There's an underlying message that it's not about what you can see. That the Dajjal is, the, the Jal is preaching and teaching you. It's all about what you see. Right? But every single surah, uh, every single story in Surah Al-Kahf is trying to explain to you that it's not about the tangible and the empirical, it's about something beyond that. It's about the intangible. It's about the ghaib. Yes, so Allah has created everything in this world to test you. But it's not about what you can see, it's about what you can't see. So you learn about the, the iman of those people, the people of the cave. That they, you know, whatever they saw, they didn't accept that. They had enough iman and strength to move away from the, from the king who was telling them to worship him. The, first story, the second story, the, the story of the two gardeners. Again, one gardener thought that, oh, I have everything because it was all tangible. Right? But the other one, the other one was saying, listen, <laughs> some, there's, there's something greater. You say, you know, say MashaAllah. Right? And the third story is what? Story of Musa and Khidr. Khadir alayhi salam. What's that about? Again, intangible, the thing that you can't see. There's a king coming at the back with a massive ship, right? This child's going to grow up and become a tyrant, therefore I have to kill him, right? Beneath this wall is a treasure. By the way, that treasure, they say that it was the name of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Imam Sawi says this in his, in his tafsir. All the thing, all about the. So why is Surah Al Kahf? Protection from the fitna of the Dajjal because Surah Al-Kahf is reminding you that life's not about what you see and what you think. That's what it means by Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb. Khair, I, I completely digressed. What was I saying? What has the Prophet ﷺ done for you? Okay, what is the Prophet ﷺ now doing for you? If it wasn't for him, right, uh, uh, going back to, yes, reading the Quran. Look at, if you read the Qur'an and you see some of the things that people would do and Allah would punish them as a result for it, you'll be very, very surprised because most of the things that people did in previous nations that Allah punished them for, we do in this nation today. And I can name you so many arrogance, you know, they, you know uh, the previous nations, what did they do? They were arrogant, they thought that they were greater than other people. Uh, they killed the messengers. There was a, there was a nation that was completely uh, uh, wiped out simply because of uh, you know their their love for sodomy. Tell me if this stuff doesn't happen in this day and age. Of course it happens. You know when you sin, why is it that Allah doesn't strike you with a lightning bolt straight away? You know when you when you decide to sin or when you do something or whatever you've done. Why is it that Allah doesn't punish you straight away? Why is it that Allah hasn't swallowed you up using this earth? The earth by default wants to swallow you up anyway. That's the, this, it's the nature of the earth. Allah says we have made this earth 
We have actually humbled and subdued the earth. Allah has made this because the earth by, by default wants to swallow you up. Allah says, Dhalul, and we've actually humbled the earth for you. Tamshu fi manakibiya. So walk in all of its corners, walk and travel the earth. So why is it that the earth hasn't swallowed you up? Why? Because what is he doing for you? It's because of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because of the fact that he's amongst us now, that's why the earth hasn't swallowed us up. That's why, uh, you know, uh, something hasn't come from the, from the heavens and uh, from the sky and completely uh, decapitated us. Why? Simply because of the presence of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam amongst us. وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُعَذِّبَهُمْ أَنْتَ فِيهِمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will not punish them whilst you are amongst them. Wow, is Haliya here? Wa anta fihim. That's what he's doing for you. What else is he doing for you? Not just for you, not just for me, by the way. For every single person that's living, you know, whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim. Right? You know, there, there, there comes a point for every type of person. Regardless of who you are, there comes a point in their life where, as we say in, in, in the UK, we say the penny drops. What do I mean by that? There's always a point of realization that everybody goes through, whether you're Muslim or non-Muslim, where, and that point of realization is, what am I doing with my life? You would have gone through this realization. Everybody will eventually go through this realization. What am I doing? All my life I've been earning money, I've been doing this, I've been you know, busy with X, Y, Z, and you think to yourself like, oh, where am I going with my life? Babe? Okay, so even the non-Muslim, goes through that realization. The penny drops for the non-Muslim as well. Right? The penny drops for the Muslim. Sometimes it may take a calamity. Sometimes it may take your father passing away, or your mother passing away, or your grandparents passing away. Sometimes it may take an accident. You're breaking your leg, or your arm, or something like that. But eventually, somebody, everybody comes to this sense of realization. But you know, at that point, at that point, the difference between me and the non-believer, the difference between you and the non-believer is that you have Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So what is he doing for you now? He gives you hope. Because no matter where you've been in your life and what you've done in your life and how many sins you've committed in your life, it's he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who says, At-ta'ibu min al-dhanbi kamalla dhanbala. The one who repents from a sin is as if he's never sinned before. It's he, sallallahu alayhi wa who says, Kullu ibn Adam khata'un wa khayrul khata'in atawabun. He says that every single son of Adam will sin, will make mistakes, but the best of those who are, are those who return. So each and every single time the penny drops for you and things become difficult, you have the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and therefore you have hope. That is him, sallallahu That's what he's doing for you, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what will he do for you? Well, we'll recite it anyway. Ya Akram al Khalqi Mali Man Aludu Bihi Siwak. When the day, on that day when everybody will run away from you, Yoma Yafirul Maru Min Akhi, Wa Ummihi Wa Abi, Wa Sahi Batihi Wa Bani, Ikuli Imri Im Min Hum Yoma Idin Shatnu in Yogni. And your parents will run away from you, your brother will run away, your sister will run, everyone, your spouse will run away from you. Nobody wants to know you. They're only worried about themselves. Hatta up to the point where you go to the prophets and they say, no, we, we, we can't do anything. Until they say, you know, غيري, go to someone else. Until you come to that individual, what will he do for you? What will he do for you on the day of judgment where everybody runs away from you, you will go to him and he will intercede for you, for you to go to Jannah. That is our Prophet, that is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Now you tell me that after knowing all of this, how can you not love him? But the problem is, is look, I'm, I'm telling you this is about you and just really reflect on this. Because the, only, the, the, the simple solution is this, if you don't reflect, you won't adore and if you don't adore, you won't love. So there's any message I can give you at the end of today and, you know, the tangents that have been going on and small things that I've dropped here or there. And, you know, if there's anything I can tell you is that 
if there's one thing you take away, you take away that I need to increase my reflection when it comes to Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa And in order, in order for you to do that, you introduce certain things in your life, in, your, in the life of your children, wherein they have a chance to reflect about Him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa alayhi Whether it's gatherings, whether it's a small, you know, uh, you're, you're just, you're around the table, uh, you know, at home before you're about to eat. And you, you maybe mention, this is a, a, a nice thing that you can do. I haven't implemented it yet because I don't have children, but inshallah one day. You know, you, you read one uh, passage from the, uh, the Shifa of Qadi Iyad, rahimahullah ta'ala, just before you eat. Or you read one hadith from the Shama'il, just before you eat. Get your children to do it. There's translations of Shama'il now. Yeah, sit down together and say, okay, let's, let's do something. Wherein you've stopped your life for a moment and you've given that time to reflect about the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa You've given that time to reflect about Allah. Yes? So you do that. Implement small, small things in your life wherein it gives you that opportunity to reflect about Him sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam and it gives you an opportunity to reflect about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also recite more Qur'an. I have to say this and our people, we don't recite much Qur'an at all, fortunately. If you find the greatest, the greatest of, uh, of, of, uh, of awliya uh, the greatest uh, men of Allah, you know, when they got to a point in their life wherein, you know, they, everything finished for them in the sense that they, they were old and they had done everything that they had to do. The only thing that they would do is recite Quran all day, every day. Uh, the Sheikh Abdul Rahman al Shaghuri, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, some of my teachers say that, you know, he's the teacher of my teachers. My teachers would say, the, whenever you would meet him, all he would be doing is reciting the Quran near the end of his life. Literally, every single day, you'd go to his, his place of, of, of rest or his shop or uh, wherever he was and literally the only thing you would do is recite the Qur'an. We don't recite the Qur'an enough. So, dhikr is one thing. Even the burda is one thing and I am, I'm not put, putting people off these things but I'm saying Qur'an is so, so, so important. For your spiritual health and well-being, the Qur'an is so important. So, introduce it and implement it in your life. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts this from us. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants us the ability to truly uh, reflect upon him and reflect upon his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa akhiru da'waya anilhamdulillahi rabbil alayhi.